So let's think about Easter mysteries. In my ministry, I, I live for light bulb moments. You know, those times when somebody suddenly gets it. Um, you know, there's a revelation of truth, of a revelation of God, which changes their life forever. You know, conversion, regeneration, being filled with the Spirit, being born again, whatever word you want to use for it, it's the experience that people have had for millennia of when they come face to face with the living God and decide to give their lives in, you know, to be lost in wonder, love, and praise of God. And of course, this happens with non believers um, discovering God for the first time. But in my experience, it happens also a lot, actually with believers, with people who've faithfully gone to church, often for decades, but have never really internalized the faith, never really got it themselves. And then something happens, you know, that pow moment where God um, becomes real to them in, you know, in a new way. And the fruit of that new revelation, in my experience, is always, is always you know, a more, you know, a closer following of Jesus, a more fruitful discipleship, a more givenness to mission. And in just, in my experience, again, in just about every case of such conversion has come the question, people who have been converted said, particularly those who've been in the church for a long time but never really had that moment, they say, why didn't anybody ever tell me this before? You know, and whether it's about the, the Holy Spirit or the kingdom of God or whatever, there's this deep conversion is always linked to a deeper revelation, a deeper understanding, not just in the head but in the heart of God's Word. So that's why over the next few weeks um, in this Easter season, we're going to be taking a fresh look about what the Bible really says about some concepts that we've heard about in connection with Easter. Words which we've heard but probably never really understood. And it's our prayer that as we engage with these Easter mysteries, so God will give us a new revelation and refresh our faith and give us new motivation to um, be agents and ambassadors of his kingdom. So, Eastertide, let's look at these Easter mysteries, these words which we see in our liturgies often in church, as I said before right at the beginning, um, salvation, resurrection, heaven. What is the content in these concepts? What does the Bible really say? Not the things that we think they mean or that the culture tries to tell us they mean, but what does the Bible say about them? And today we're going to start with what the Apostle Paul called of the matter which is of first importance and that is the resurrection. And particularly to, today we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus. So, the resurrection of Jesus, what happened and what is its significance? Now, on Easter Day, the Reverend Raphael Warnock, who is a US, uh, a US senator and also a Baptist pastor, he tweeted on the meaning of Easter. And in this tweet, which became very controversial, I don't know whether you saw it, but he claimed that the meaning of Easter, and by which he meant really the motivation to social action, was more transcendent, more important than the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this caused a great furore in America. Reverend Warnock is a Democrat and therefore the right-wing conservative evangelical Trump has cried heresy. Now, I'm not interested in the politics um, tonight or delving and, you know, spending time looking at the politics, U.S. politics and, or even Reverend Warnock's understanding of Easter. But it does raise the question, 
Did Jesus really die, and was he really physically raised again? And even if he was, um, why is this important, other than, you know, God's ability to do miracles? Now, many today in the UK don't believe that God exists, nor do they believe that Jesus was real. And even if they've heard of the resurrection, and we can't assume that people these days have, but they'll put it into the category of um, fairies at the bottom of the garden. If this has happened to you, you shouldn't be too downhearted. Let's remind ourselves, you know, some people, it's not just Jesus or the resurrection that people deny. Some people deny climate change. Some people deny the Holocaust. And, and as we've seen recently, some have in the, what could be described as the most advanced country in the world, some denied the plain to see electoral results um, of a recent election. So we know that people, people deny, uh, live in denial for all sorts of reasons not based on evidence, but based on cultural or, you know, rejection of things. So we're not going to waste time deconstructing people's um, rejection of the resurrection. However, we must, even as we start, we just need to acknowledge that there are various theological interpretations. As we see revealed in this tweet by Reverend Warnock, it's, um, you know, some so-called critical scholars or liberal theologians, they have suggested, probably for cultural reasons, but um, but we won't, again, we won't spend time on this, but they, there has, there is a school of thought which has said that Jesus didn't, didn't rise from the grave but, um, on the third day in a, in a new and bodily way, but that the resurrection was actually just the livingness, that's the word they sometimes use, the livingness uh, of Jesus or his spiritual example inspired the disciples to go and follow in his footsteps. So it wasn't that Jesus rose from the dead in a literal sense, it was just his example which inspired people. Now, okay, people have different opinions, but let's be very clear. The church, from the beginning, has believed in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ. Indeed, St. Paul claimed it was the crucial foundation of the Christian faith. Maybe you can see on screen. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, reading from the first third verse. Paul says, for I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. We'll look at that in a bit. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And it goes on about um, Jesus, the resurrected Jesus appearing to James, and last of all, to Paul himself. Elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus, we in, after his resurrection, he was physically touched by his followers. He ate food with them. He proved that he wasn't just a a ghostly apparition or a hallucination, that he was there in a very real bodily sense. And following his resurrection, inextricably linked to it as part and parcel of the same event was, of course, Jesus' ascension to his place of ruling on the throne in heaven. And also to his sending of the Holy Spirit to empower the church to continue Jesus' work of proclaiming the kingdom. 
Now, we don't have time to talk about the Ascension and Pentecost tonight. But the point is, as I said before, Paul, the, the apostles, the founders of the church all said the physical, literal resurrection of Jesus is non-negotiable. Now, there has always been some pushback about the claims of Jesus' resurrection. Now, Matthew's gospel tells us how the chief priests spread rumors that the disciples stole Jesus' body to pretend the resurrection never happened. Now, isn't it interesting that Paul mentions that there were 500 living eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus who would have been alive when he wrote 1 Corinthians, about 20 years after that first Easter. Clearly, the reason why the chief priests lie, they're rumor-mongering that the body had been stolen and so the resurrection was just a hoax. The reason why this didn't get established was because there were so many eyewitnesses. It's a bit like Manchester City uh, releasing a press statement today saying that the Latics never beat them in the 2013 FA Cup final. Now, it doesn't matter how persuasive their press release would be, there'd be tens of thousands of Wiganers saying, no, that's not true, because we was there. We saw that Wigan won. And so it is with the, with the resurrection of Jesus. It's too many people saw Jesus raised from the dead for there to be a credible uh, a credible rejection of it. Now, once, of course, the eyewitnesses had died off and some time had gone, had, had passed, then, and, and this is a, you know, a common view today, is that some critics started to suggest that the apostles invented the story of the resurrection in order to big up Jesus and give him credentials, messianic credentials that he never claimed for himself. I think it's worth subjecting this objection to a little bit of scrutiny. Because the basis for most people's objection to the resurrection is this. Dead people don't rise physically from the grave. Therefore, the resurrection must be untrue. That's the logic. And of course, Jewish people 2,000 years ago, especially no-nonsense fishermen and tax collectors, you know, and people like that, they knew very well that dead bodies didn't become alive again. But the significance of the resurrection goes much deeper than whether God can do miracles such as raising a dead Jesus. And over... 2,000 years worth of uh, theological reflection. Of course, there are 10,000 ways we can look at, uh, you know, to analyze and delve deeper into the resurrection of Jesus. But I'm going to choose this way because I love this. This is my favorite part of theology. is something which scholars call biblical theology. And biblical theology is just simply looking at the Old Testament, how it links with the New Testament, and discerning some common themes that run through all of the scriptures. So let's do, you and I, let us do a little bit of biblical theology on the resurrection of Jesus. So I'm going to look at the roots of the resurrection. And the first root, as we, start, as we look back in the Hebrew scriptures, in what we call the Old Testament, about is resurrection just an invention of the apostles or was there evidence to suggest in the scriptures in the Old Testament that there was an expectation of resurrection? First thing we look at is going right back to the, the goodness of creation and the reality of evil. So we're going back to page one of the Bible. And I think we really need to take hold of that if we, if we want to get the full import of the meaning of resurrection. Now, if I asked you, what is the main characteristic of God? God is dot, dot, dot. I wonder what you'd say. I bet you, if I bet 10 pounds, I'd get rich if, if, if I bet 
you would say love. God is love. And of course he is. And, you know, the New Testament says that God is love. But if we look at Genesis chapter 1, God is first of all presented as creator. That's the first descriptor of God in the Bible. Creator, God. And what he creates is good and he loves it especially his crowning achievement, which is human beings, which he describes as being very good because they alone are made in God's image to reflect God in the world. Listen to this. Creation is important to God. And as you carry on, you go over to page 2 and you read Genesis chapter 2. Genesis, that, this Genesis chapter 2 presents people Adam and Eve, living in perfect harmony with God and the creation. This is, to use a big word, paradigmatic. That is, the way things should be. And as we leaf over to Genesis chapter 3, things start to unravel a little bit. We're introduced to human temptation disobedience and rejection of God's word and the destruction of that perfect harmony through the estrangement not just between God and people but also between people amongst themselves and even between people and the creation. It's what theologians call the fall. If we read from Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 it says, God says to the woman, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. We can start to see a breaking down of human relationships. Verse 17, and to the man God said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, not to be taken out of context, and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Everywhere relationships are broken, and the stewardship of the earth on God's behalf, that is humanity's great vocation, is deformed and becomes instead about domination and control. God's paradigm has been corrupted. Okay, moving on. The second root for resurrection, we have to look at covenant. So after the, we read about God's creation and the fall and this breaking down of the perfect harmony that God wanted for, for between God and people and creation. He, uh, God initiates a rescue plan. First by calling a man, Abraham and his family, but then ultimately a nation, Israel, to be light to the world, to help all humankind understand what it means to live in a way that human beings were always intended to live. This is what we can call covenant. Now, the covenant wasn't about rules as such. Rather, it was this question. How can we, as human beings, authentically live, behave how God wants us? What is authentic human behavior in relationship to God? Covenant addresses how we relate to God, to each other, even to the animals in the field, even to agriculture, to the creation itself. Moving on, another strand, another root of, uh, of the resurrection is the promise of new creation. Not only did God call a people you know, a kingdom of priests to demonstrate authentic kingdom living, authentic human living. And of course, we know that Israel, at least in part, failed in its vocation there. He also started to whisper promises through his prophets, merest glimpses of how 
God would remake and renew the world to restore it to its original harmony. And we start seeing thrilling passages like in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, it says, verse 2, In days to come the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall, many peoples, nation groups, not just Israel, ethnic groups, many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord not of any God, of the Lord Yahweh. To the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. And it goes on, for out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Now, the best endeavors of the human project of liberal democracy, of communism, of any type of human political endeavor has never been able to achieve that sense of harmony described by Isaiah. Not, or nothing, and certainly not if you go over a few pages to Isaiah 11, and you'll know this, or at least you'll know some of the words of Isaiah 11. It says, the wolf shall lie down with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down, sorry, the, the wolf shall live with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And it goes on, says, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Verse 8, it continues, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Yes and amen. That is a day we long to see. Can you not see the direct link to Eden? And the undoing of the curse of Genesis 3, even the antipathy between humans and serpents. And of course, you can go elsewhere in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 47 talks of a river flowing out of a, a new, uh, God's new temple perfect and flowing, um, flowing into dead and dry places. And wherever this river goes, there's teeming life, even the healing of the nations, the world, even the broken places are becoming like Eden of old. So we move on from the promise of new creation. Finally, the fourth route I want to look at is an emerging concept of resurrection. Now, if you read the Hebrew Scriptures, it doesn't take much discernment to see that Israel didn't dwell much on thoughts and questions of the afterlife, at least not until late in the Old Testament period. It's what scholars call unfolding revelation. Rather, the Hebrews, the Israel, they focused on God's involvement in this life with the you know, the rewards of the righteous and the punishment of the wicked taking place in the present age. And even in famous passages like Psalm 23, which we love to read out in funerals, particularly the final verse of Psalm 23 where it says, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, even there in the Hebrew. Actually, forever doesn't, doesn't carry echoes of eternity. It means all the days of my life. Nevertheless, 
Israel didn't believe in what we might call annihilation after death. You know, a, a, a simple, you're dead and gone, and there's no continuing existence. No, rather they believed that existence continued on, at least on, a, on one level, in a place called Sheol. Now, Sheol was the Hebrew place of the dead. Now, depending on what Bible translation you have, Sheol will be rendered um, in, in, you know, the Aramaic and the, the Hebrew Sheol will be rendered as the grave or maybe as death, and in the Greek translation as Hades. And you might recognize Hades from its use more in Greek mythology as the underworld, the netherworld residence of the dead. However, it doesn't, it doesn't seem that Sheol took everybody. Indeed, Enoch, Enoch in Genesis chapter 5, Enoch was and then was no more and went to be with God, and Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 9, they didn't die and go down to Sheol, but it says, the Bible says, they were taken straight to God. And as we carry on reading, there's an emerging expectation of a physical life after death. Not some sort of disembodied existence as a wraith, or as a shade, or as a sort of a some ghostly creature, but in a bod physical bodily existence after death. In Job chapter 14, uh, verse 14, the question is posed, if, mortal, if mortals die, you and I are mortals, will they live again? And it gives rise to the famous verses in chapter 19, which you can see on your screen and which no doubt you've heard songs about. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that at last he will stand upon the earth. I wonder who Job is talking about. And after my skin has thus been destroyed, then in my flesh I will see God. And in the so-called Isaiah apocalypse, in chapters in Isaiah chapters 24 to 27 it says and Paul quotes this in in 1 Corinthians says this he God will swallow up death forever then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people will be taken away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken and if we go on and look at Isaiah 26, verse 19, Isaiah says, Your dead shall live, their corpses shall rise. O dwellers in the dust, that is the dead, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a radiant dew, and the earth will give birth to those long dead. Now, it has to be said that in Isaiah, at least as far as I read it, and I'm, I'm sure this is right, is, is that resurrection is reserved for God's people. Isaiah's speaking over God's people and a resurrection of Israel. But in what is seen as the climax to the prophet's declaration of resurrection in the Old Testament, which is Daniel chapter 12, we see the first complete statement of a resurrection of both the just, the righteous, and the unjust, the wicked. And if I can read it out to you, this is Daniel chapter 12 verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. But you go your way and rest. You shall ri rise for your reward at the end of the days. <laughs> we can see that resurrection was not the invention of some radical followers of Jesus. We can see it right there throughout the Hebrew Scriptures. And so what did 
Jewish people believe by in Jesus' day? Well, you, if you uh, have been a Christian for some time, you read the Bible, you might have heard of a sect, a Jewish religious sect called the Sadducees. They were basically the ruling liberal elite in cahoots with Rome, like the chief priests. They were Sadducees. They denied the resurrection um, or any type of afterlife. And also there were some Greek-influenced Jews, like the famous philosopher Philo, uh, who believed in Plato, who's a, a Greek philosopher, Plato's suggestion uh, that a disembodied soul escapes at death the prison of the body and enjoys a purely spiritual afterlife. And I, I wonder if you ask, that's probably what most Christians believe happens even today. But despite Philo and these Greek influence thinking and the Sadducees, it was very uncommon to not to believe in resurrection in Israel in first century Palestine. Indeed, most Jews in Jesus' day held together the tension of Sheol or Hades, that God would take care of their soul after death until on the last day, the great and terrible day of the Lord, God would give them new bodies and restore the whole earth to the harmony that we saw in Eden of perfect relationship between God and people and creation. And if you think I'm making this up, just open to John chapter 11. And as Martha said to Jesus before the tomb of her dead brother Lazarus, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. That was the contemporary Jewish belief in Jesus' day. So let's take a step back and reflect on all that we've just learned. I just wonder, are you starting to get a fuller, a richer understanding of the real significance of Jesus' resurrection? We haven't had time to look into all the verses, of course we haven't. But we do know, and you can see if you read the Bible yourself, in many places, Jesus declared how he, the Messiah, would be killed and rise again. He said this on a number of occasions. It wasn't a surprise to Jesus that he would be crucified and resurrected. And by doing so, by making this declaration, Jesus was consciously connecting himself to the grand theological promises and themes of the Old Testament. He was saying, all these promises, they are going to be fulfilled in me. Just look at them, creation. Just look at this. God made humans to be in perfect relationship and obedience to God. And Jesus, he was the true and faithful Adam. Let's go beyond creation. Let's look at covenant. You know, Israel was called and failed to be the light of the world, to de demonstrate what authentic human living looks like in covenant with God. Yet Jesus was truly the light of the world, and he sealed a new covenant in his blood. What about resurrection and new creation? God's promise to uh, completely renew creation where the broken old order of suffering and death was no more. That was God's promise. And Jesus arose in a body that was transformed. Yes, physical, yet lo no longer prone to death and disease. And a body which could exist at the same time both in heaven and on earth. That's why you could see Jesus sometimes amongst the disciples and sometimes he was clearly up in that dimension that we call heaven, the place where God is. In Jesus' resurrection, we start to see the fulfillment of all the promises of God. Clearly, Jesus' resurrection was not the great and dreadful day of the Lord, what Martha calls the last day. 
you know, when all things are restored. It wasn't that, because we see brokenness and disease and death still reigns today. But as Paul calls it, Jesus' resurrection was the first fruits of the new creation. In my mind, I see it like those great, you know, like a domino run. Do you know what I mean? Maybe I have an age. In days before people had online gaming, we used to kind of like set up dominoes and knock them over. And, and even the, you'd see that on telly. <laughs> And did you ever see those great domino runs where you would knock one over and then they would end up knocking over thousands, a chain reaction where thousands of dominoes be knocked over and create some sort of beautiful pattern on the ground. Jesus and his resurrection is like the first domino and because that's fallen, it's set into sequence, a chain of events that will, must end with the final resurrection, the final recreation of the heavens and the earth, the fulfillment of God's ultimate plan. And if you don't like the thought of dominoes, it's like a good in this um, Easter and this spring season. Resurrection is like the first daffodil or the first crocus that um, appears in spring. Even though the wind might be howling, and as we've seen here in Wigan in the last week, the snow falling, yet when that first daffodil, that first flower appears, you know for certain that the rest are going to come out at some point soon. Brothers and sisters, Christ's resurrection wasn't just a miracle or an excuse for us in the church to have a party and sing thine be the glory although it is a great hymn the resurrection of christ is the epicenter of history it's god's own down payment that absolutely guarantees the new creation truly our eternal hope is anchored in the fact that jesus rose again physically from the grave. However, his resurrection is only just the beginning. Next week, we're going to look forward to that future event, the final resurrection of all, and how you and I will be involved in that, and what we should expect of our ultimate destiny. And we'll start looking at some, maybe some controversial questions like, is heaven really where you're going? And me? Is that ultimate destination? Or do we expect something else? So make sure you join us next week here on Church Wigan Live as we continue to look at Easter mysteries. I wonder if Will is able to come up and help create that canopy of worship which we can find so helpful so we're just going to respond and pray into into this into what we've just heard before we finish tonight just a few minutes and as people were praying before this this broadcast um, tonight our prayers were hearing, were sensing God was saying, God wants to break through into someone's life tonight. Listen, we're not manipulating. We're not trying to do power of suggestion here by saying, you know, sometimes you can get cynical and say, well, of course they're going to say that. No, I trust the people who are praying. Our proclamation does not rest on our wisdom or clever strategies or deceitful manipulation but on a demonstration of God's power and we believe God wants to break through into someone's life tonight there was a picture of somebody making a pom-pom you know those woolen pom-poms and that as you make them they're very flat and yet when you when they when you've finished 
doing all that stuff with the wool in its flat, you make the cut and suddenly it bursts forth into something much more beautiful. That's the promise tonight. Is that you? Do you want to know the power of the resurrection in your life? Do you want to see, even, even if it's only by, through eyes of faith, that, as it says in Isaiah, that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord, Wigan, um, Marsh Green, Winstonley, Swinley, Ashton, Hindley, Worsley Mains, that these places will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In your household, in your workplace, in your church, in your neighborhood, do you want to see it being filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea? I do. Do you want to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, even as the waters cover the sea? If you do, by faith, open up your hands and I'm going to pray for you. In the name of Jesus, may the eyes of your heart, the eyes, the spiritual eyes, be opened to the truth of God. May the power of the resurrection, may the reality of Christ in me, the hope of glory, may that be yours right now. Come Holy Spirit, Come and fill all those who cry out to you now, who ask. Fill them with your power. Fill them with your grace. Give them new life. Bring true, deep conversion. Come, Holy Spirit. Psalm 42 verse 5 says this, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Have you been feeling downcast? Felt some sense of unrest inside of you? In faith, you can't do anything else but put your hope in God. Even now, just say, God, I put my hope in you. Help me praise you, my Savior, my God.
Let me encourage you to, uh, if you have any questions about resurrection or any of these Easter mysteries, why don't you put them in the chat bar and we'll see whether we can address them in subsequent weeks. We are, as a church, as God's people, are called to find out more about, discover more of God's grace. I mentioned about unfolding revelation. It took the nation of Israel 2,000 years of scriptures of hearing from God, discerning of God through the prophets, of God speaking through different people to really discern, to get, get a fuller picture of who God really is. And, and supremely, we see in Jesus Christ all the fullness of God. And through the Holy Spirit, we have the means by which we can recognize who God is. But we don't get it all at once, step by step by step. So be encouraged. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank God daily for the reality of the resurrection. And know that whatever happens in your life, if you are in Christ, in union with Jesus, then you have a place at the resurrection. That you have a secure, in Christ, a promise of the new creation. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you this week. May the Lord give you kindness, show you his kindness, and fill you with his peace. Amen.